the Old Testament and to the prophecy of Amos and chapter 6. We touched on these uh, verses just a couple of weeks ago, some parts of them anyway, but let's read uh, a passage, a few verses from Amos chapter 6. And Amos was sent to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel just before it was taken into captivity. <clears throat> so Amos chapter 6. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and thrust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Calne and see, and go from there to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put off far off the day of doom, who cause the seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, Stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments, and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls, and anoint yourselves with the best ointments or perfumes, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Amen. And again, we pray the blessing of God to accompany uh, the reading of his own word. Now let's uh, turn to uh, consider with God's help a few verses from uh, the prophecy of Jeremiah and chapter 48. Jeremiah chapter 48. And uh, the verses that we read here uh, occur in a few chapters that are giving uh, messages to a group of nations. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. And this message is addressed to the nation of Moab. And uh, the verses that I want us to focus on particularly are verses 11 to 13. So let's read them carefully. Jeremiah 48 at verse 11. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste remained in him and his scent has not changed. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I shall send him wine workers who will tip him over and empty his vessels and break the bottles. Moab shall be ashamed of Chemosh, that's their God, just as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, their confidence. So in verse 11, Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs. Now, uh, as I just mentioned there, a few weeks ago, uh, we saw how God's prophets were not just national prophets preaching to God's covenant people, but they were also international prophets. God also sent them to the nations, nations that ought themselves uh, to know the Lord and nations that are accountable to him. It doesn't matter how much of God's revelation they had. They were accountable for what they did with what they had. That's true of us all. We don't give account for what we don't have, but we do for what we have. Now, some of these nations were very important nations 
in world affairs. For example, uh, Egypt, which receives a message from Jeremiah and indeed from Isaiah and Ezekiel. Egypt was one of the most powerful nations upon the earth, but God speaks to it and he does so through his prophets. Now, all these nations uh, that are addressed are neighbors, more or less, of Israel, and they are also enemies of Israel, enemies of God's people. And uh, the nations stand for different things. I think we can say that they all represent various kinds of people who oppose God's kingdom in different kinds of ways. Uh, It's interesting to to notice as well that some of these nations are prophesied complete destruction. For example, Edom, which we looked at just a couple of weeks ago, and again, uh, Babylon as a city and as a culture. Others, although they're given severe judgment, are actually promised a time of blessing to come. And that surprisingly includes nations like Egypt, and Assyria. Assyria, there are very strong uh, promises in Scripture that Egypt will be brought back as a nation into the service of the Lord and into close union with God's people. But in any case, I want to look with you tonight at this message from Jeremiah to the nation of Moab, which is immediately to the east of Israel, separated from Israel by cliffs and by the, Red sea, by the Dead Sea. Now, it's not obvious in the passage here, but there's actually, in these very verses that we've got, verses 11 to 13, there's a, a stark contrast in them between Moab, an unbelieving, hostile nation on the one hand, you've got Moab, a contrast between them and Israel, which is effectively a God's church or his visible church in the old covenant or under the old covenant. Now, he brings this contrast to the fore, the contrast between Moab and Israel, by using an analogy or using a figure from the world of winemaking. Now, uh, the process of making wine and letting it settle and decanting it and so on is something that I'll come to a little later because it's important for properly understanding these verses. But For now, it's just enough to say that uh, Moab here, as a people, are compared to wine that is settled on its lees. And you'll notice that he has been settled on his lees or on his dregs. These are, by the way, just the little bits of, of grapes at the bottom of the vessels. The wine or Moab and the people of Moab have been settled on their dregs or on their lees from their youth. Verse 11, Moab has been at ease from his youth and he has settled on his dregs. Now the the meaning of that uh, on the face of it is very straightforward. Since she became a nation from her youth, in other words, Moab was never seriously troubled. She had a desert on her east side and she had the cliffs and the Dead Sea on her west side. She was involved in a few minor wars, uh, which nation wasn't really, but she had no great principle to fight for, uh, and she would always quickly sue for peace. And that wasn't difficult to do because she was a very wealthy country. Uh, The name Moab itself means the land of desire, and um, one of the judgments uttered against her here is that she will no longer be called the land of desire. But she was that. She had vast livestock and especially famous for a a vast uh, number of sheep. So she always bought off her enemies and she bought peace. No great principle to live for, just for wealth and peace itself. So the result of that was that Moab was never in a destructive war, uh, never in captivity, never taken away from their land, always at ease, and therefore the figure here of settling on her lees, or as we would think of it, aging like a fine wine. Of course, most of us are familiar with the fact that good wine 
spends a good time on its lees. That's Moab. On the other hand, and this is more implied here, I suppose it, it doesn't come out so obviously, but on the other hand, we have Israel or the people of God. From her youth, since she became a nation, she's been troubled. Not at ease, but troubled. And in, in the psalm that we sang a minute ago, you'll remember that Israel says so herself. Often did they vex me from my youth, may Israel now declare. The plowers plowed along my back and long their furrows drew. And you've just got to scan the history of scripture to see that that was so. She was always surrounded by the enmity of the Canaanite nations. And twice she was brought into serious collective captivity. The Church of God was brought into captivity into Egypt, first of all. And now she's been brought into captivity into Babylon. And her constant experience as a nation, unlike Moab, her constant experience is just strife and conflict. And that's what's being compared here with being poured out from vessel to vessel in verse 11. In other words, there you have the contrast. Moab has been at ease from his youth, settling on his dregs. He has not, and here we understand, unlike Israel, been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Now, on the face of this, I mean, if you were presented with these two portions, uh, who would want Israel's portion? Surely it would be far better to live at ease in Moab than to live troubled like Israel. Or perhaps to put it in New Testament terms, you would rather enjoy the pleasures of Egypt rather than the affliction with the people of Israel. And in a way, you'd think that this figure lends itself to that kind of choice. After all, just as I mentioned a minute ago, isn't wine good when it's left on its dregs? When it sits on its lees, uh, it gains strength. Uh, wine gains body. It gains flavor. And that, uh, by the way, is why the gospel itself is compared to wine on the lees. When Isaiah speaks about a, a feast being prepared on this mountain, that's on Mount Zion. That's uh, from the holy city. God prepares a feast. Of course, he does it when Christ is crucified there and the gospel is first preached there, preached from Mount Zion. That's the feast prepared, the table spread, and all the nations are invited to it. He, he says it is a feast of choice pieces and of wines on the lees. In other words, there again, we have the gospel full bodied and flavored. It, it's not a bitter wine or a thin wine that hurts the throat, but something that is full-bodied, smooth, and lively. Therefore, um, surely the Bible here is commending Moab, you would say. Th th there's something commendable about being settled on your lees rather than being hurriedly emptied from vessel to vessel. Well, friends, that misses the point. It's not good to settle on your lees. Why not? Well, because in making wine, settling on lees is not necessarily a good thing. In other words, it depends on the quality of the grape and it depends how long it's been left on it. If the grape itself is not good, then if the wine is left on it, it ruins the wine. It acquires a bad smell and the taste of vinegar. Now, <laughs> vinegar may have its own use, but it's no use for drinking. At least it's no use for drinking when you wish to drink wine. And that, you see, is the problem with Moab. And it's the problem with the people of Moab in particular. And the people of Moab are representing here sinful people. People who are not in Israel and not in Israel by choice, and people who resist Israel and will not affiliate with the people of God. The fact is that Moab's easy providence in life made her very proud and complacent. Now, it's interesting that the prophet Isaiah had noticed this before. 
He spoke about Moab too, and he said, We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is proud and arrogant. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud and he is arrogant. And you'll notice in this chapter here, Jeremiah 48, that uh, Jeremiah more or less repeats the same words. If you go down to verse 29, you see it there. We have heard the pride of Moab. And then in brackets, he is exceedingly proud of his loftiness and arrogance and pride and the haughtiness of his heart. It's essentially the same thing being said, but it's said again and it's said again so that we understand the message that Moab and the people of Moab, the worldly people of Moab, are fundamentally proud, lofty, arrogant and haughty. Why? What's she got to be proud about? Well, uh, according to herself, plenty. Maybe you feel that you do have plenty to be proud about. And you feel that just as she did, she thought she was a self-made nation. She had made herself. She had made her own prosperity. She had made her own safety and so on. So you may think the same. You've made your own safety. You made your own security. You've made your own wealth. You've made your own prosperity. And Moab thinks that whatever Israel is undergoing, and whatever the threat from Babylon, it's just not going to touch her. But why does she think that? Well, there's two reasons for that, and there are two reasons that are very important for you to consider tonight if you're not a Christian. The first one was very simply wealth. In verse 7, we're told, or Jeremiah tells Moab, that you have trusted in your works and in your treasures. I mentioned at the beginning that Moab was the land of desire, rich, fertile land. And that wealth has become a kind of security for her, just as it does for yourself. And money makes the world go round, they say. And money answers everything. The book of Proverbs tells us that the rich man's wealth is his strong city. Now, of course, we're always to remember that this isn't true of every rich man. But as a general rule, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. In other words, it's his wall of protection. Um, Christ spoke about people who trust in riches. I think, well, it's, it always seemed to me a strange expression how you trust in riches, but you trust them to provide security. In fact, there's a financial term called securities, uh, kinds of financial assets, uh, financial assets of a certain kind, they're called securities. The idea is that money is somehow a security. And there are some people, plenty of people, especially in a covetous world like we have in the West, people who think that they can buy themselves out of any kind of trouble, that money does answer everything. No, of course, it doesn't. I say, of course, I hope you realize it doesn't. Eventually, even the money you have takes wings and it flies away. In uh, Psalm 49, we're reminded about these things. It's a, a very powerful psalm. Let me just um, read it for you rather than risk qu quoting it wrongly from the metrical version. But it's, it says in Psalm 49 and verse 6, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. In other words, you have a brother, you desire to deliver him, you're concerned for his soul, but all that you have, uh, even if you gave it, it can't do that. It can't redeem your brother, it can't ransom him from the pit so that he would never see it. It just doesn't work that way. Money has its limitations and they're severe. That's why he says in verse 16, don't be afraid when one becomes rich. Don't be afraid of their persecution. Don't envy their status when the glory of his house is increased. For, well, here you have it. When he dies, he shall carry nothing away. And his glory, that's the glory that he has in wealth, shall not descend after him. Though he blesses himself while he lives, men will praise you when you do well for yourself. 
he shall go to the generation of his fathers, and they shall never see the light. The bottom line is that money secures nothing, nothing of real value. It secures nothing of real value because it is of no use in purchasing your own soul from death or purchasing the soul of your mother, of your father, of your brother, or your sister, or your son, or your daughter. And uh, they thought their wealth would be a comfort against Babylon. But they were to find out that it wasn't. The second thing that they gloried in, in Moab, was just the fact that they could use their wealth in a wise way in order to stay out of trouble. And they prided themselves on never being in trouble, or if they were, they got out of it. Self-protection. There were some nations in World War II uh, who should have involved themselves in the conflict, but they didn't. They chose neutrality. They chose peace. They preferred peace to war, even when there was a war to be fought. And when there was a cause for which to fight a war, no, they chose neutrality. And uh, I suppose we all know people like that, um, people who just seem to be very good for themselves. They're never at the coal face of anything. They're never in a conflict. In fact, they spend all their energy to make sure that they're never in one. And they pride themselves in that. They think they're great politicians, worldly wise people. Never stood for anything. Never took a hit for anything. They congratulate themselves on avoiding trouble. And they congratulate themselves on their ability to handle people and to negotiate their own peace. And in fact, they look down on anyone else who's in trouble as not having these gifts and qualities. Um, They don't really achieve anything of significance either, except their peace. They've got their house. They've got their car. They have their securities. They've got their wealth. They're never troubled. You'll never find them in a conflict. Uh, But as the man said long ago, they sleep beneath the moon. They bask beneath the sun. They live a life of going to do but they die with nothing done. And uh, what's significant here, you see, is that this condition of wealth and ease sits right beside Israel in agony. They're aware of Israel's agony, but they don't help. And they don't care. Like the rich man in the parable who couldn't care less that Lazarus had been placed at his own gate in order to test it. The interesting thing is, you see, one of the interesting things is that Israel were neighbors to Moab, or Moab were neighbors to Israel. And just like Edom, uh, which we saw about three weeks ago, Moab were also in covenant with God. It's easy to forget that. I think people often do, but they were also in covenant with God because their ancestor was Lot. In fact, the nation had an awful beginning from a case of incense, sorry, incest in Lot's family. They, They were descended from Lot through incest. But of course, the, the covenant membership did belong to Lot, and uh, he may indeed have put the sign of the covenant on his children. But they've turned away from that, uh, and they're now in enmity against it, just as possibly some of you are. I mean, you've had these things, you've grown up with these things, but you've turned against it. And in fact, Moab holds God's people in contempt. If you look at verse 27 here, that Jeremiah says to Moab, um, in verse 26, he exalted himself against the Lord. Moab shall wallow in his vomit, and he shall be in derision. Why? Well, was Israel not a derision to you, he says to Moab? You despised the people of God. Was he found among thieves? No, he wasn't. Why did you deride him? Deride him. Why did you despise him? For whenever, he says, whenever you, Moab, speak of him, Israel, you shake your head in scorn. You shake your head in scorn. And again, you see, we know people like that. You've only got to mention the Lord, mention Christianity, mention church, mention the Bible, mention prayer, anything like that. And their faces change. They're happy all day long talking about anything else especially things that are to do with their own securities and their own ease. But the minute they hear of God's cause, their faces change. Don't talk to me about that. Sometimes they suppress their feelings, but still they're written on their faces. 
uh, proud of their wealth, proud of their ability to preserve themselves, and they're arrogant with it. He exalted himself against the Lord, verse 26. And again, you'll notice it in verse 42, the same expression. Um, uh, Moab shall be destroyed as a people because he exalted himself against the Lord. Now, um, this kind of pride led to complacency. Complacency. Um, That's what happens to us when we think we've done well. When we think we've done well for ourselves, we've got on in life and so on. We begin to think that no trouble will come our way. At least nothing major. We've got it all marked out. I remember a person I knew, a very worldly person, and uh, his wife died. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, we didn't plan it this way. I know this is hard to believe at one level, but it's the way people think. He said, we didn't plan it this way. I was supposed to go first, he said. I was supposed to go first. And certain things were supposed to happen too, according to this man's conversation, before he went first and then his wife second. But there was no sign of any urgency to put anything right with God. And this complacency is what we read about in the gospel according to Luke. The the Lord Jesus Christ says, well, when I return a second time, it'll be to a complacent world. Just as it was before the flood when people were eating and drinking and being given in marriage. Just as it was on the morning when the sun arose and shone over Sodom. uh, When people were again eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. Or as Paul says about the Thessalonians, or to the Thessalonians, he says, when people say peace and safety, destruction comes upon them suddenly. Now you see what's wrong with eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. Nothing, nothing. It's just that that soul that was in their lives and they were complacent with it. They thought they could look after themselves and take care of themselves. But how little makes these people tremble? I mean, one minute you look at these people with self-confidence, full of self-confidence, and along comes the coronavirus. God breathes through the coronavirus, and suddenly these people are shaken. I don't know if you've noticed in recent weeks, but there's less arrogance, certainly, in the world. And comfort, I'm sure that there's still plenty. Of course, people speak about themselves conquering the virus and getting rid of the virus. That's right, but there's not quite the same arrogance. It's as though people feel a little bit of vulnerability. It's as though they were saying what that man said, this wasn't how we planned it. This wasn't wasn't our projection for the economy for the next five years. It wasn't the projection for the German economy or the Japanese economy or the American economy. No, it wasn't, because you were doing the projecting. It wasn't God's projection for for the economy. And and if we, if we shake like that with a coronavirus, what will we do when God shakes us? Us and when he shakes heaven and earth? As Proverbs says, the complacency of fools will destroy them. Their very complacency destroys them, keeps them from looking at things that are more important in life. Or as the psalmist says, because they have no changes, they do not fear God. It's not an interesting expression. Because they have no changes, they do not fear God. Life's the same, comfortably the same, comfortably the same, and therefore they don't fear God. Um, I read a while back, I took a note of it, somebody who once said that the greatest curse outside of hell is to be left in peace until it's too late. Let me say it again. The greatest curse outside of hell is to be left in peace until it's too late don't envy moab sitting on her lees settling on her lees because inside that vessel there's a stench and there's an awful taste she might think herself to be a great vintage but if god were to taste her he would spew her out of his mouth And uh, in verse 12, you have the terrible judgment upon them. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I shall send them wine workers, or literally wine tippers. 
These are people who are used to pouring from vessel to vessel. But that's not what they're going to do with this, with these vessels of wine. They will tip them over and empty the vessels. This isn't racking them or decanting them. They will tip them over, empty the vessels, and break the bottles. And Moab shall be ashamed of Hemosh, that's their God, just as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, whom they trusted their confidence. Um, and this happened. Their diplomacy failed. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't impressed with their land and with their sheep. He was uh, fed up with their arrogance. And the fact is that he laid Moab waste. He laid Moab waste. And that's the way it is with you. You are at ease in life. You've, you've had your life worked out, maybe, and it's gone very, very well. It's not always going to. Uh, God, who has given you so much goodness, will judge you for being at ease in your goodness. Now, when you turn to Israel, the, the picture here is very, very different. Instead of settling on her lees, Israel is being decanted from vessel to vessel. Now, that describes a people who are in a state of a constant conflict. Now, I said in the morning, let me say it again, it's not just Christians who have afflictions. It would be foolish and insensitive to say that. Um, everybody has a measure of affliction in this life, and some people have a considerable affliction. Uh, Moab did too, even though she could buy her way out of it, until there was <laughs> no way left to do that. But there are afflictions that come upon you, as I said in the morning, simply because you're a Christian. And just as the world can't meddle with a Christian's joy, because the world doesn't understand it, neither can the world meddle with a Christian's sorrow, because the world doesn't understand that either. Christians experience the assaults of Satan as, as you don't, because Satan's not bothered with you if you're not a Christian. Uh, the staggering thing is that you're on his side. Uh, even, though he, even though he's your enemy, uh, he's duped you, and uh, you're on the same side. You don't experience his fiery darts as the Christian does. Neither do you, do you experience persecution from the world just because you are a Christian. You don't know what that's like. You don't know what it's like to be ostracized or to be laughed at or to be left out of things just because you are a Christian. You don't know that. Neither do you know, for that matter, conflict within. I know you can sometimes agitate over things within yourself, but I'm talking about a real conflict and a really difficult conflict where the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh and you have no real rest in that conflict at all. It's, um, it's just all the time. I suppose in one way you, you knew that was the case when you became a Christian, in one way. Moses, after all, when he made his choice, he chose to suffer affliction with God's people rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He knew there was a choice to be made, and he knew that the choice in becoming a Christian did involve affliction. But on another level, like I said in the morning, we, we underestimate the intensity of that and the incessant nature of it. And in spite of the joys that are involved in the Christian life, it just sometimes wears us down. And when we come to, well, like what we could say is hill difficulty, as Bunyan called it, there's a tendency to try and walk around hill difficulty. There's a tendency to try to avoid our duty or just to compromise a little bit while we're in the world. A tendency, as the psalmist said, to envy sinners and perhaps just to try and get a little piece of a little piece of the peace that the sinners seem to have. Um, that may seem a rather simplistic thing, and you may think of exceptions and so on, but it's obviously very real. I mean, the psalmist speaks about it. Um, the best case, best known case, the clearest case is Psalm seventy-three. God is good to Israel, he says, but my steps had almost slipped. Because, he says, I was envious of boastful people when I saw their prosperity. 
There are no pangs in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble like other men. And here he's thinking about the trouble that comes upon himself as a believer. They're not plagued like other men. No, he says, their eyes bulge with abundance. They don't lack anything. They have more than their hearts could wish. They speak arrogantly. Um, They are the ungodly, he says in verse 12. Yes, admittedly they are, but he says they are always at ease. Notice that expression. It's like being on your lees. They increase in riches. And then he says, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocence in vain because I'm plagued all day long and I feel like I'm being chastened every morning. Now, of course, he tells us wonderfully immediately after that, that when he went to the house of God to worship, he gained a proper perspective, he says. Um, When I thought about this, he says, it was too painful until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. They are in a slippery place. They are brought to destruction in a moment, consumed them with terror. And uh, on the other hand, he says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. Even in my trials and tribulations, you hold me by your right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and you will afterwards receive me to glory. But you see, when you view the world like that, there is a temptation to settle like the world, on your lees. Just withdraw a little bit from the conflict. Uh, Move yourself out of it so that life will be easier for you. Why? Well, same reason as Moab. I mean, if, if we're talking about grapes here, we're no better by nature than Moab. The grape of human nature is there, um, and it, it, it'll destroy the whole vintage. Unless God does something, unless he pours us out. That's what's called here the process of racking or decanting or pouring from vessel to vessel. That's just a way of carefully, you have to be trained to do this. You have to take the wine and tip it. Not a way to destroy it, but you take the wine, you tip it carefully, and you pour it from one vessel to another so that the impurities are removed. In in other words, you see that this vintage will be bad too, unless it's done properly and done early. Remove the impurities, which are not good. And then just after a little while, decant again from that vessel to another vessel. And you will have, despite a poor quality of grape, you will have a vintage that can be drunk. The, the spiritual equivalent to that being uh, decanted from vessel to vessel is just being shaken from your nests and from your comforts. <laughs> As the world often says, being moved out of your comfort zone. And the way that God does it is just through trials and tribulations. And the design of these things is to bring us back to God himself. We, we lost God before because of trials. And we chose ease instead. So God sends a special series of trials just to seek himself again. We're being decanted. Now, when we're being decanted, it's not easy. Um, We feel like your very soul is being poured out, uh, just like the wine poured out from one vessel to another. When God is decanting us, we, we almost sometimes feel like we're losing our life. All we're doing maybe is changing a place of work or moving a church or an upheaval in a family or something in connection with that and you're being poured out because you are. You are being poured out. It's good for you. It's good for you. And you'll discover it's good for you when two things begin to happen. One is that the world which began to allure you again is now again vain. Have you Notice that. Can you recall it in your experience? Can you recall a time when you started to settle on your lees? And then God tipped you over and decanted you. And the world that attracted you, mesmerized and fascinated you, again, you saw it vain. And it's a wonderful thing to see it like that. 
The reason is because that's what it actually is. It's vain. It's vanity fair. Man walking in a vain show wherever you look. The foolishness of things. The foolishness of programs. The foolishness of adverts. The foolishness of theatrical productions. The foolishness of Hollywood. The foolishness of news channels. The foolishness of everything. It's so vain. And coupled with that sense of the vanity of the world, the renewed sense of the world's vanity, there is a new or a renewed hunger and thirst for God, for God. Now, when I'm speaking about the Christian here settling on your lease, please make sure that you take that warning seriously. Um, Because if you do settle on your lease in a serious way, it, it may require serious decanting to salvage you. Um, we, we read in Amos there, woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Now, this is speaking to the church of the northern kingdom just before their final captivity. And in, instead of finding a church that's really agitated and concerned and prayerful, it, the people are so different. He says they're lying on beds of ivory. Now, again, here you see they're well off. The idea is luxury. They're not sleeping on these beds. They're just lying on them. They're stretched out on couches, he says. And they sing idly to the sound of instruments. You know the way people just sing and sing and sing. They sing songs. They listen to songs. They listen to songs in the morning. They listen to songs in the afternoon. And they listen to songs at night. And they sing idly to the sound of these instruments. They drink wine from bowls. The idea there is that they're drinking from excess. I mean, who drinks wine in a bowl? Well, that's the equivalent of having two or three glasses of wine, maybe more, and you anoint yourselves with the best perfumes. Well, we've certainly been doing that in the West. An abundance of perfumes, an abundance of fragrances, and they're all beamed through the adverts onto our television screens. Therefore, God says, they shall go captive as the first of the captives. The spiritual carelessness. Woe to those at ease in Zion. Or Sephaniah too. Um, let me just... Um, in Sephaniah, in chapter 1, and verse 12, uh, God says this. Now, listen to this. And this again is, is prophesying the captivity of Judah this time. It shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps. So this is a thorough search. And I will punish the men who are settled on their lees. Now, notice what's true of these people. I will punish the men who are settled on their lees, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Now, what does that mean? It means that these these people who, believers, many of them, have, have settled into a state of complacency where they don't think the Lord is really responding to anything. He will neither do good nor do evil. Um, as though God was oblivious to these things. It's a kind of practical atheism. You, you see it sometimes in people who say that God's doing nothing particular with the coronavirus here. Oh, it's just, it's just one of these things, you know, one of these things in the world. Well, is it really just one of these things in the world? If the coronavirus is just one of these things in the world, tell me, is there anything at all in the world that isn't just one of these things? Would any event at all of a worldwide dimension cause you to think that God has done that and that God is speaking through it? It's the apathy of a people who have become complacent, utterly complacent in their Christianity, a practical atheism. And if you don't watch that kind of practical atheism that says God won't do good and neither will he do evil, it'll just become gradually a full-blown atheism. So there was a spiritual complacency in the northern kingdom and there was a complacency that God was going to search out in the southern kingdom. But what about the most awful complacency of all in the New Testament? It's the church of the Laodiceans. 
what strikes us there is that, I mean, in another church, we're told that there was a remnant. We're not told that of the church in Laodicea. There is an appeal. If any man hears, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yes, but we're not alerted to any kind of group in Laodicea who seem to be awake. And the shocking contrast in Laodicea is, is between how the people in the congregation saw themselves and how God saw them. And John highlights, and John's given a commission to highlight that to them. You say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Notice, by the way, there, that subtle claim to being self-made. I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. But God says, you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What a heap of adjectives that is. What, what an awful description of anybody's soul. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And what leaves it so awful is that the people think they're rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. God says, because you are lukewarm, he says, I will spew you out of my mouth. And to take that and import it into what Jeremiah is saying, he says, I open the cask, I find you on your lees, but I smell vinegar, and I taste vinegar, and I will spew you out of my mouth. If you're at ease, take warning. If you're not at ease, if you feel you're being poured out, be glad. Be glad. It's a sign of life. It's a sign of life. Um, take yourself to God. Pour yourself out in prayer. When, when you're being poured out by God in your circumstances, pour yourself out to God in prayer. And your pouring will come to an end. You'll be saved for a time in another vessel. And when each pouring is over, God will take you through that fire and water and he'll bring you to a, a wealthy place or literally a place of liberty. He'll bring you to a piece of, place of liberty and you'll rest there for a while until he sees fit to pour you out again. But when you come to that place of, of liberty and rest, you'll say this, and, and the world will never say this. You'll say, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, or I got cold, or I got complacent. But now, he says, I keep thy word. So don't envy anyone settled on their lees and strangely be glad that you are being poured from vessel to vessel. May the Lord bless uh, these thoughts on his own word.